It's officially silly season in Chiefs Kingdom. Would you trade one of your best players just to get draft capital? I'm going to tell you why that's silly today on Locked on Chiefs. From the land of the free and the home of the Chiefs, this is the Locked on Chiefs podcast. Welcome back, everybody. This is Locked on Chiefs, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day for free over and over and over. You can find us anywhere you get podcasts plus YouTube. If you'd like and subscribe, we would very much appreciate that. Thanks for making us your first listen. Check out another Locked On show for your next one. You can find anything on any team that you want to know about right now. I'm going to get into this, and Chris, you may vastly disagree with me, but I was ready to start this week and be focused on the combine, and now this kind of lunacy shows up. Uh, and silly is the only word that I can actually use for it that is probably safe for this audience. So that's what I'm going to call it today. Uh, I'm Ryan Tracy, the founder of Rogue Analytics and Performance Consulting, NFL33.com, as well as RGR Football. And I'm Chris Clark. Thank you all for listening. And we have been covering this team now for, what, seven years? Seems like uh, maybe yeah, eight buddy. years, even even going back to pro football spot. Throw that back in the day. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, lots to talk about when we start looking at different trades that could be happening for Kansas City over this next couple of weeks. Uh, and then you also get into a conversation that Eric Bieniemy had with Adam Schefter. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the show. But let's go ahead and dive into the trade that you're calling silly. No, no, you set it up. You set it up because I can't keep a straight face. A lot of people in the in Chiefs Kingdom seem to be talking about trading luxurious need right now. And I get it to an extent. I don't necessarily agree with it, but I get it to an extent. He is in the last year of his contract in 2023, and he is going to cost close to $20 million to sign long-term. That's just the reality of it. Now, is it the best move for Kansas City? I'm not saying that. Is it a smart move? I'm not saying that. If somebody wants to give him a one and a two, maybe you consider it. But I don't think that they're going to get – Better than the, their, I guess, I, I don't know what NFL circles think of Sneed to see what the return that he would bring would be. So you say people are talking about trading Legere's Sneed, the still on a rookie contract, best corner on this roster that they found as a, as, as a nugget of gold in the fourth round, right? Well, you know who ain't talking about that? Brett Veach. That ain't happening. This is just conjecture. This is clickbait, and I'm sorry you all got roped into it, and I'm even more sorry that we are actually having to have this conversation where we have to stick up for the, the bonuses of keeping Legereus Need. There are so many things that go against this, making any kind of common sense to anyone that works in the league that I just I, – I don't even know where to start. Yes, it's there's it. a simple thing here that he is going to have to be renewed and he is going to be expensive. That seems to be the only reasonable thing that I can find that anyone would even consider talking about this, and I know it's not happening inside the organization. It's it's kind of funny because the last time that you said something big that wasn't going to happen, it did happen. So, I, I shut up. Tend to agree with, I tend to agree with you. I think that this isn't something <laughs> the organization wants to go and do. Uh, but I I will say I do get the thought process of, of it. I understand why the thought is out there. Yes, he is one of the best players the Chiefs have. They went and drafted three guys last year. All three of them looked like they had the ability to start. Uh, and you're looking at a situation with Snead where corner is a premium position and you're going to be paying him $20 million a year, more than likely starting 2024. So I get it from that perspective. Uh, and can you afford to pay him the $20 million to keep him here? That is going to be the question that the Chiefs are going to have to answer. The other part of this to me that I think is even more interesting is that if Kansas City is going to sign him to a deal, I think it's this year, not next year. Mainly because I think that if they want to sign him to a long-term deal, they want to, even if it's going to be like a four-year deal, it gives them the ability to spread out the cap over five. Mm -hmm. And they can execute the deal with low base salaries. They can keep his number low until you're past the initial year of, of the other stars that they have to do. Um, I, I agree with you. I think there is interest in doing this now. The only thing that I could see that prevents this from happening maybe even before the draft just so you know what's going on but certainly before the season is if there's some kind of extenuating circumstance if there is you know some 
some report that makes you feel like there's some kind of physical ailment or some kind of problem that you can't foresee with Jerry's going forward or it being some kind of risk. Because do they think that he's at risk for more concussions? Right. That that's that, that's exactly the thing that I'm thinking. Like the only medical reason, because he's been he's been pretty solid, but the concussions are always a scary thing, right? The fact that they had him back at the end of the season, I think that was important, but there is that one medical concern. I don't think that it's enough. And in order to get to that point where you would trade him, it would be taking the whole playbook of the Reed Veach era and throwing it out the window. That is just not plausible to me. And I think what ends up happening is people get nervous about the cap number. It's it's still minus 3.5, right, as of today? Yeah, and, and really it's probably negative 23.5 considering they're going to tag Orlando Brown by the 7th. So you've got a little bit more than a week to get that taken care of. So they're going to have to get under the cap by $23 million more than likely before uh, 315. And they have to tag him on 3-7. So mm -hmm. uh, they've got, I guess, two weeks to get that taken care of. Yeah, I mean, th this whole the whole concept here is, I think, a reaction to the fact that that's coming down the pike and the, the fact that they are negative on the cap right now. Um, I, I will just say one thing, and I'll give you the exact reason why this is so out of left field in the next segment. But I will just say this, and I think you, of course, will appreciate it, and hopefully everybody listening will appreciate it. There has been an instance in the past that should have taught us all to be not so sensitive to what's going on with the cap as most teams have to be. And that is 177. Okay. <laughs> this will get figured out. I, I there's more magic left to be done between Brad Tillis and Brett Veach. I am not concerned about that. And, and the hold my beer 177 moment is exactly the reason why. And that's fair. I get it. I, I understand where you're coming from. And I think that it's, it makes a lot of sense that we don't have to worry about the cap gear as much, but there are going to be a lot of questions that have to be answered when you start looking at what this team is going to try to build for the 2023 season, uh, it's going to be, it's going to have to mostly be through the draft. They're going to have to make some moves free agency wise, just to bring some of their own guys back in uh, EFRAs and restricted free agents. We've kind of talked about those guys. There's going to be some other things that they're going to have to do as well. And they need to have another probably seven or 8 million to sign their draft class. So right now you're negative 30. Uh, with that, before you get into the, into the RFAs and the EFRAs, yeah, there's there's a number of things that have to happen. It is certainly not an easy hill to climb, but there are a lot more options than we thought. And I'm going to tell you exactly why and what we know of the Chiefs' philosophy and team building, and what team building in general tells us that this should not be one of the options, unless there's something we don't know about yet. We'll do that right after this break, and, and a message from our pals. If you're looking for a delicious treat, but you don't want all the fat and calories, then you've got to try a built Bar. We just got through the holidays, and I know my goal is to eat better and eat healthier, and I absolutely love built Bars. You've got to try these. What makes built, what makes built Bars so good? Well, for starters, they're covered in 100% real chocolate, and they come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter, brownie, and coconut almond. And now you don't have to wait around to get a box. We've been telling you for years to go to built.com to get your – Built Bars, but now you can get them at Sam's Club or Walmart. At Walmart, go to the pharmacy section and get a four-bar box of the cookies and cream or double chocolate or coconut puffs. And at Sam's Club, you can try a 13-bar box of the hit flavors brownie batter and churro. You can thank us later. I think I will. When it comes to making moves like this, I will break it down for you. And this is what it all comes back to. It's not just that this is one of the cornerstones of Brett Veach's career in terms of finding a talent like this in the spot that he found. That's not something that you really base your decisions on, but it does create an emotional attachment for the organization and the player. Here's the big thing. The way that this whole philosophy works, the reason that these draft classes have been so important to this Super Bowl victory for the last two seasons is because this is the way that you do it in order to avoid some of the things you've had to do in the past. These are the examples. You have to grow your talent from your draft picks because in general, you have the ability to sign them early 
or sign them at a discounted rate than if you were trying to bring them in from another team that drafted them. That's the reason. You do have to have the talent. Yes, the rookies played great this season. This a player that is so far beyond where they are as rookies that leaving them to the Wolves as sophomores and trying to re-backfill doesn't make enough sense when you look at the cost per the return. Now, the Chiefs in spending in the secondary in the league. They have plenty of room to add to that. They are spending, what was it, $23 million on the secondary. And what is it, 10.4 of that is going to Justin Reed. So this is this is a reallocation of balancing it out instead of the $66 million you have in the defensive front. That makes a big difference. By letting, even the entertainment of the idea is not something I think the organization can stand because they have the ability, like you said, to extend Chris Jones, to take what they had planned to take from the Mahomes contract and be right as rain and be able to do business as usual. You don't let your but, talent go out the door. And I agree with that, but I, I don't know that they're going to m- make a move with Mahomes' contract this year. And the reason being is because if they change the roster bonus into a signing bonus for the entire amount, mm-hmm. His cap number in 2027 is $66 million, $67 million. What year and is it? It goes up. I know it's 2023, but it goes yeah, up by almost – no, hold on. It goes up by almost $7 million a year for the next five years. My point is sixty-seven, almost $67 million in 2027. That is by far the highest. That would be almost 22% of the cap, and that's kind of figuring that they get a, a, an adjusted raise of about 8% every year. That'd be huge. Yeah. I, I don't know that they want to go that direction. So extending Chris Jones makes a lot of sense. Uh, seeing if they could do something with Frank Clark and bring him back on a reduced rate would make a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Agreed. But they're running down on other places to do it. And they still have the franchise tag with Orlando Brown. Yes. I think that's a key one as well. I think we have to talk about what that particular contract or that situation plays into it because that's the other big axe to fall. But before we get to that, let me ask you a couple of questions. What did the team do with Patrick Mahomes? What was the the course of his career evolution to this point in terms of cap, in terms of contracts? Well, I mean, they paid him after they paid him as soon as he could after the third year and they have given him a lot of money and and they basically guaranteed a lot of the money for the next couple of seasons. Right. Um, They've given themselves flexibility, and I don't disagree with that. They've given them flexibility for the next several years, uh, but they're going to be limited in what they can do if they start pushing more money back and more money back and more money back. So Fair. it's got to be something that they're going to get to figure out. But they treated him right. They tried to get done as early as possible off the rookie contract, and he's here. They treated him like a top 10 star that he was at the time. What did they do with Chris Jones? Same thing, they paid him. Exactly. Who's Name me one other talent outside of Chris Jones on this defensive roster that's as good as LeJarrius Sneed. Who's who's anywhere near a contract negotiation? No one's near a contract negotiation. So can we agree that with Travis Kelsey on the other side of the roster, that LeJarrius Sneed is one of the top four players in this organization? Yeah, I would say top four, top five. So do you not feel that the philosophy is you pay your top five, maybe six, and you use the rookie contracts to balance out the load until you have to start stacking them? And they are about to have to start stacking them because Nick Bolton's coming, and we know we have things down the road. But for this season. Yes, but they also have Joe Tooney that's costing them $22 million this year. Exactly my point. By doing all of this, you'll get LeJarrius Sneed and you'll eventually get Creed Humphrey and Trey Smith at what will be an early signing, hopefully a third year, and avoid having to do what you had to do with Tooney and Orlando Brown and Alex Smith before him where you give up draft assets and all kinds of free agent money to try to get your roster right. It's It feels like this is supposed to hurt, but in the long run, as the evolution year to year to year Signing Legereus Need now, even if it stings a little bit, helps you in the long run 
in terms of your total cost, not only at the corner position, but in the secondary in general, on the defensive side of the ball, which is still only costing 41% of the Chiefs cap. It's just an investment back into yourself, and I don't think there's any way that they can avoid that. We'll see. I don't disagree with you that he's one of the best players that they have. He's probably he's easily, I would say, top five. Tooney is up there, and I would argue Nick Bolton is really close. Yeah. <laughs> a lot closer than a lot of people would want to give him credit for, but uh, he's not going to be in a contract here until after this next season, so right. I won't have to worry about that right now. And I think I think the long term is like it is like steps up the staircase, right? It is going to get more hectic as we go forward. That's that's for certain, especially with Chris Jones playing as well as he is at the age that he is. That complicates things. Joe Tooney, same situation. Uh, I, I think that will start to alleviate itself. And the deal that we'll talk about in the next segment is going to be about Orlando Brown and what that has to be, and what that means as well as the Eric Bieniemy piece. We'll do that right after this. Okay, so the complication, and it is a significant one that you mentioned, is Orlando Brown. I think there's two possible scenarios. And if you're going to trade a top talent at a position of value in this league, for me, it's got to be Orlando Brown. And it's got to be a tag and trade with the expectation that he can get the contract from wherever he's going. And you move on and you draft another tackle, you sign a lesser free agent if that's the way that you feel you need to go. But I think that's more not only stomachable in terms of the fan base, certainly for the cap, and I think it also gets you out of what may have been a point where you thought Orlando could turn into a tackle that is prototypical in your offense instead of a guy who's good in your offense but is still not a perfect fit. I'm going to be shocked if they're able to do a tag and trade, mainly because one, he would have to sign the contract. He'd have to sign the franchise tender for him to be able to be traded, and they'd have to get it done by the draft. Because if you can't get it done by the draft, then you're stuck in a situation where you cannot replace him this year, and that is right. going to be very hard to handle. Very, very astute. So as we boil that all that down, left tackle is generally more – valuable across the league than cornerback is especially in today's league where it's you're running three corner sets all the time you don't have the the old school shut down type corners anymore because they're not allowed to thanks to the rules and the refs but given those two things what do you think is more likely just if you were making the decision orlando or legerius i think orlando is going to cost more uh, and I don't know that he's worth the extra cost, quite frankly, but it, it's the market value. It's what he's going to get on the markets, and, and that's what's going to determine what he's going to get. I don't think Sneed is going to get top of market money. I think he could get really close, but even if he gets top of market money for quarters, that's $20 million a year. It's not twenty five or or more, which is what Orlando's looking for. Agreed. And I think I think there will be people across the league and maybe even in the Chiefs organization that say, listen, you're playing great. You're our best player, but but you play the nickel and you don't take half the field away. I'll bet you they can get it done for less than that 20 that you're talking about. And I think in the end that ends up being more economical. I don't think that this is a consideration, like I said at the top of the show, in, within the organization. I think fans want to think about that because it's an option. But I think it is much more likely that we see LeJerry Sneed in a Chiefs uniform for the next five years then we see Orlando Brown in a Chiefs uniform. That said, somebody we won't see on the sidelines is Eric Bieniemy, And he had a couple of things to say, one that in particular that kind of took us a little by surprise today. Yeah, it took me by surprise. Listening to him talk to Adam Schefter, Adam Schefter talked to him and specifically asked him, when did you know you weren't coming back to Kansas City? And the answer basically from Bieniemy was, Coach and I talked about it before the season even started. We kind of both knew. We didn't tell anybody else, but we kind of both knew that if I didn't get a head coaching job, it was probably not going to happen, that I was not going to be coming back. So sounds like he knew he was not coming back to Kansas City regardless of the situation. And, I mean, he was clear to say that Reed said that he was welcome back, but they both thought that the problem is is that Reed – Reed, according to B enemy, Reed told him that he feels like he's holding them down. Eric doesn't feel like Reed is, but but Andy's right. 
the rest of the outside world is always going to see you as the little mushroom underneath Andy's umbrella. I think I think it's a year too late. I think they should have come to that conclusion last season. But it just surprised me to hear him say it out loud that we had kind of arrived at that logical conclusion before we even began this Super Bowl run. I mean, it does it does give you a glimpse into their their post game emotional outburst there. You know, like it, just knowing that hey, we knew this was the end of the road, and yet we ended up at the at, at the pot at the end of the rainbow anyway. Yeah, you ended up at the pinnacle, and you knew that it was going to be that way uh, before the season even started. So, you know, I think it, it means a lot that he's getting a chance with Ron Revere, and I think that it's, if he's able to show that he's able to do something, I mean, <laughs> he's going to have his workout cut out for him. I'm not saying he can't do it, but, you know, they don't even have a quarterback right now. They just released Carson Wentz. They don't have a quarterback, so yeah, they like got to figure that out. I think they like Sam Al. I don't think EB's going to like Sam Howell, but we'll find out what happens there. <laughs> yeah, going for Patrick Mahomes to Sam Howell is going to be quite the interesting predicament in my mind. Ah, uh, yeah. But you put Anthony Richardson in an Eric B. Enemy offense, I'm interested to see what happens, to tell you the truth. So we'll find out. How silly is this to you all? Would you like to see the Chiefs try to recoup some kind of value in moving away from Legereus Need in a trade. I'm very interested to see what you all think. Go vote. Trade Legereus, yes or no, in the comments down below. Hit us at Locked on Chiefs on Twitter as well. Love to hear it there. Even in the Spotify and iTunes resumes. Let us know what you think. How crazy is this? Because I think it's a 10 out of 10. But we want to know what you think. Chris, officially, you're like a three? No, I'm probably more like a seven. I, I do think it's somewhat crazy, but I just... I. I get the other side of it from a cap perspective. It makes sense. They have a lot of stuff that a lot of moving parts that got to get figured out. And I know they have a plan. They, they talked about having a plan, you know, when they signed Patrick and, and knew what they were going to have to do in a lot of different ways. So there's ways to make it work. It's just going to be interesting to see how they do it. It's official. My friend, uh, you are now going to be known as the Mr. Spock of this podcast relationship, because that makes too much logical sense to me. I refuse to go there. So, folks, let us know what you think. Thanks for being with us today. Uh, we'll get back to actual reality tomorrow. At least we hope so. Matt Derrick will be with us, and he'll give us the inside scoop of what's going on in the organization. Thanks for your time today, and we'll talk to you then.